the next speaker is Tiago Cogumbreiro, and the title is Mechanized Theory of Computation for Education. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Tiago, and I want to talk about uh, a project that I started and then Yannick uh, joined at some point. Um, so I'm an assistant professor at UMass Boston, and I've been using uh, COC to teach uh, theory of computation uh, for the last three years, I would say. Um, so the main motivation for this talk is um, I want to talk a bit about how proof assistants help uh, with students uh, learning this material. And then I want to talk about the project itself. Um, and I want to um, you know, overview a bit of the techniques we've used. So the main motivation for this work is really realizing that uh, introduction to theory of computation, and by this I mean um, decidability, computability, um, formal languages, uh, is really taught for mathematicians and logicians when most of the students, they don't have the same, uh, they don't have the same concepts and notions. So I felt that my students were getting a bit uh, anxious about the material itself so I, I was very interested in finding new alternative ways of making it more accessible to students. And there's many ways in which I try to achieve that, one of which is using uh, proof assistance. Uh, so the context of this work is in an um, undergraduate course. Uh, these are for students that are in their third or fourth year. Uh, and this is a compulsory course, so they have to take it. Um, Students have no experience with uh, using a proof assistant, and they, are, they use it uh, very successfully to complete this course. Um, so there are a few ways in which I believe uh, proof assistants are very useful uh, in this context. Uh, first of all, it lets students uh, be very, very autonomous because they can follow uh, the material without the need. Oh, wait, actually, let me take this out. <laughs> It's almost dying here. Um, so the students, don't, they, they can uh, study independently without needing a tutor or anyone else. Uh, they can step through the, the, the proofs. And if they're designed in such a way, it even uh, can expose students to certain abstractions. So you can have the higher level details first and then uh, the smaller level details uh, hidden away in a different lemma. Uh, and the idea is really uh, that this also helps a lot with um, grading uh, because now uh, these assignments they are actually things that can be run and checked by a tool that makes it very useful uh, especially now with remote classes and that was something that I really ripped the benefit uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, another thing that it, it helped a lot I think is that it kind of changes the problem into uh, like a softer problem. So they, they looked at this before it was a pen and paper exam course, and then it became a project-based uh, programming uh, course. Uh, and students did appreciate that as well. Uh, so this is an open source library that you can uh, download, um, and the URL is over there. Um, where we include not just the uh, results on decidability and decidability, but also regular languages um, included in the library. And we have homework assignments as well for all the other material, but that's not in included. But you can ask me, and I'm happy to share. Um, so the work that I want to focus today is really on computability and on decidability. Um, and the, I just want to give you a, a kind of a, a baseline so you understand the idea is to, was to formalize um, a very popular and widely used textbook by Michael Sipser's uh, Introduction to the Theory of Computation. And the intent was to make um, the Koch formalization as close as possible to the textbook. So it was not something that I just wanted to state the theorems and prove it myself. I wanted uh, something that the students could choose to read what is in the book or they could choose to read what is in the Koch proofs and they would not be lost. So as much as possible, a connection between both is, is very valuable. Um, so I, again, because students have no past experience to Koch and I do want them to read the proofs, um, it's very important to keep the, the proof simple, 
they should be read for anyone who is, works uh, or learns Scoc in a month. After that, they should be able to read the proofs. Uh, a, a benefit is actually the material. The proofs that are in Michael Sipser's book are actually quite simple. Mo a lot of results don't even need uh, proofs by induction or anything like that. I do teach it just because I think it's important for students. Um, we do include in the open source library some alternative proofs uh, if it's pedagogically interesting. So if they're smaller or you know um, they use fewer concepts, so then um, I will ex I will show those as well or include those in the library. Uh, so what you see here behind me is uh, an exam an excerpt from the book from uh, Sipser's book uh, where we prove. Um, in this book that uh, the language ATM, um, where we define firstly the, the language ATM, so this is any language that is recognized by a Turing machine. Um, and then this is the proof that shows that ATM is undecidable. To do that, uh, in the paper, Sipser defines this notion of high-level descriptions. And this is, uh, you can think of it simply as a domain-specific language to declare composition of Turing machines. So this is the thing highlighted in yellow. I'm going to show it a bit bigger uh, so you don't need to squint your eyes. But this is kind of the context in which it will show up. It's, the context is the proofs. Uh, and the proofs, um, you know, this whole thing would be a, a Cox script. But what I'm going to talk about is just the part in yellow, just so you see a bit how it looks like. Um, so the language for, uh, is formalized, uh, the notion of running a Turing machine is a very simple construct, uh, a proposition that takes two parameters. The first one is this term of this uh, high-level description, uh, and the second term is whether or not the language was, uh, sorry, the, the program was accepted, uh, the input or not. So true if it accepts, false if it does not. Uh, do note that a term run may not hold. So the notion of looping is just, it simply does not hold. Uh, so you can have three results. Uh, oh, one very important thing that should be noted is that this work uh, uses classical logic, uh, although it's, it, use, uh, it uses Coq um, as, a, as the proof script. Uh, so a language is just a function from, a, from an unspecified input to a proposition. Uh, run is what I showed you already. And then you have, uh, this is also in the book, the notion of encoding uh, a string, or sorry, a uh, Turing machine as an input and the, vice, the reverse of taking a, a, a machine and getting the, the input back. Uh, so you also need axioms for that to move to and from uh, an input to Turing machine. Uh, and finally, we also rely heavily on a an axiom that given a function that goes from input to program, you can uh, find a Turing machine that recognizes it or computes that function. Um, and then this is um, an example of, of the so-called high description language. As you can see, this is just a Coq definition. And I try to match it exactly as is in the book, although it's you know just D is a bit cryptic, but it does make sense in the context in which it appears. Uh, so you can see that we have a notion of a let binder uh, to compose uh, multiple uh, what we call programs. Uh, and then we have, um, here we're using the cock conditional, and we have the notion to return a value. So the syntax is very simple. Return a Boolean, whether it accepts or not, calling a Turing machine with a certain input. Um, and then you have the let binder. And with these four constructors alone, you can already prove a lot of what it is in the book. Um, uh, of course, as you can see before, you, you, we take full advantage of Cox definitions uh, and conditionals that you can use uh, in a proof description. So it's not just these four, right? There's a bit more. Um, and this, these are the results that we are able to prove, uh, as you can see. Um, it's basically all of, sec of chapter four and five that is in the book, uh, from which I highlight um, the Rice's theorem, which was proved by uh, an undergraduate student in a one-month project, um, which I, I find it very interesting. And now she's working on an uh, undergraduate thesis uh, where she's going to contrast that proof with uh, textbook proofs and mechanized proofs. Um, and for future work, uh, I'm working with Yannick to try to prove the consistency of, of this axiomatic uh, version 
uh, of the theory. Uh, and there's a, I have lots of ideas on um, I, using proof assistance in a classroom in, environment. So if you're curious about any of these, uh, please uh, reach out. Um, and that's basically what I had today. Thank you. Um, is there a is there like a pedagogical reason you decided to use cock as opposed to another proof assistant or was it just no it, it was just a because I knew it <laughs> yeah I have some opinions on on, on it if you want to talk about that later <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> you talked about both Turing machines and abstract Turing machines uh, so did so was that which which was, ah, which, your is which. which was your model of computation? Right. Which were the, the definitions you started from? Um, <clears throat> so the Turing machines are abstracted away, uh, so we don't actually have Turing machines. Um, so these are our assumptions in the slide above. Um, we assume deterministic Turing machines, um, and what else? Yeah, they either loop, accept, or reject and you can get any result from these. You, you assume that for an input, you can get any right. of those. Because the choice of computation model should be quite crucial for such a project, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, which is also why we assume classical logic. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, using a proof assistant in classrooms is uh, very promising, especially because students otherwise argue that their proof is correct and they right. shouldn't get <laughs> any mark yeah. reduction. Um, I, are you familiar with Kevin Buzzard's approach? Because he also yeah. has a very successful yeah. um, program. So, so well, d do you think um, your approach is different from Kevin's or? Um, I, I don't know it very deeply. Uh, I would, from what I've seen, for instance, there's like a very superficial and <laughs> apparent uh, difference, which is the use of notations, and I really dislike it in the context of students, because, uh, of computer science students. I feel that any kind of notation slows down the, the learning experience. Uh, and whenever I look at any kind of lean, uh, sorry, uh, math-related project, it, it relies heavily in, in notations and stuff like that. So that would be a very principled but superficial uh, pedagogical choice. Uh, oh, okay, thanks. Well. And also why I didn't I was considering using lean. I, I kind of shifted away from it because of that as well. Can you expect my proof as answer to the question? I think the, the problem with switching to lean technically yeah. Yeah, uh, would be that the lean standard library uses very early on the axiom of choice and is very extensional, meaning the yeah. axiom that any function that you can define is computable is inconsistent. Mm. So you cannot actually do this easily in Lean. And Coq has this nice property that you can use classical logic and still keep computation, computation. So magically everything works out without having to bother students with mm. real Turing machines. But the trick doesn't work in Lean unless you are willing to ignore the whole math flip and just work constructively, somewhat constructively in Lean. Let's thank the speaker.